Hi everyone and welcome back to week three of Project Lit Book Club. I'm Miss Ferris. I'll be your host today. So the last time that we met virtually, I read chapter two of The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. And we got to a really juicy part where Star was in the car with her friend Khalil. And unfortunately, Khalil was not really being that obedient in regards to listening to the officer's requests and the police officer ends up shooting him right on the street and Star is left there with her hands up screaming because her friend has just died. Um, so we're going to pick up with chapter three of The Hate You Give. And again, a little shout out. Thank you, Layla O'Brien, for letting me borrow your book during our virtual quarantine. So let's take a look. They leave Khalil's body in the street like it's an exhibit. Police, police cars and ambulances flash all along Carnation Street. People stand off to the side, trying to see what had happened. Man, bruh, some guy says they killed him. The police tells the crowd to leave, but nobody listens. The paramedics can't do anything for Khalil, so they put me in the back of an ambulance like I need help. The bright lights spotlight me, and people crane their necks to get a peek. I don't feel special. I just feel sick. The cops rummage through Khalil's car, and I try to tell them, please, just cover his body, close his eyes, cover his mouth, get, just get away from his car, don't pick up his hairbrush. But the words couldn't come out. 115 sits on the sidewalk with his face buried in his hands. Other officers pat his shoulder and tell him it's going to be okay. They finally put a sheet over Khalil. He can't breathe under it. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I gasp and I gasp and I gasp. Star? Brown eyes with long eyelashes appear in front of me. They look like they're mine. I couldn't say much to the cops, but I did manage to give them my parents' names and phone numbers. Hey, Daddy says, come on, let's go. I open my mouth to respond and a sob comes out. Daddy has moved aside and Mama wraps her arms around me. She rubs my back and speaks in hushed tones that tell lies. It's all right, baby, it's all right. We stay this way for a long time and eventually Daddy helps us out of the ambulance. He wraps his arm around me like a shield against curious eyes and guards me to his Tahoe down the street. He drives, a, he drives, and a streetlight flashes across his face, revealing how tight his jaw is set. His veins, his veins bulge along his bald head. Mama's wearing her scrubs, the ones with rubber ducks on them. She did an extra shift at the emergency room tonight. She wipes her eyes a few times, probably thinking about Khalil, or how that could have been me lying in the street. My stomach twists. All that blood, and it came out of him? Some of it's on my hands, on Seven's hoodie, and on my sneakers. An hour ago, we were laughing and catching up, and now his blood is just hot spit pools in my mouth. My stomach twists tighter, and I gag. Mama glances at me in the rearview mirror. Maverick, pull over. I throw myself across the back seat and push the door open before the truck comes to a complete stop. It feels like everything in me is coming out, and all I can do is just let it. Mama hops out and runs around to me. She holds my hair out the way and rubs my back. I'm so sorry, baby, she says. When we get home, she helps me undress. Seven's hoodie and my Jordans disappear into a black trash bag, and I never see them again. I sit in a tub of steaming water and scrub my hands raw to get Khalil's blood off. Daddy carries me to bed, and Mama brushes her fingers through my hair until I fall asleep. Nightmares wake me over and over again. Mama reminds me to breathe, the same way she did before I outgrew asthma. I think she stays in the room the whole night, because every time I wake up, she's sitting on my bed. But this time she's gone. My eyes strain against the brightness of the neon blue walls. The clock says it's five in the morning, but my body's so used to waking up at five, it doesn't care if it's Saturday morning or not. I stare at the glow in the dark stars st on my ceiling, trying to recap the night before. The party flashes in my mind, the fight. 115, pulling me over, Khalil. The first shots ringing in my ears, the second, the third. I'm lying in bed and Khalil is lying in the county morgue. And that's where Natasha ended up, too. It happened six years ago, but I remember everything from that day. I was sweeping floors at our grocery store, saving up for my first pair of J's, when Natasha ran in. She was chunky. Her mama told, it was, her, mama told her it was baby fat. Dark-skinned and wore her hair in braids that always looked freshly done. 
I wanted braids like her so bad. Star, the hydrant on Elm Street busted, she said. And like that, that was like saying that we had a free water park. I remember looking at Daddy and pleading silently. He said I could go. As long as I promised to be back in an hour. I don't think I ever saw the water shoot as high as it did that day. Almost everybody in the neighborhood was out there, just having fun. I was the only one who noticed the car at first. A tattooed arm stretched out the back window, holding a Glock. People ran. Not me, though. My feet became part of the sidewalk. Natasha was splashing in the water, all happy stuff. And then, pow, pow, pow. I drove into a rose bush. I dove into a rose bush. By the time I got up, somebody was yelling, Call 911! Call 911! At first, I thought it was me because I had blood on my shirt. The thorns on the rose bush got me, that's all. It was Natasha, though. Her blood mixed in with the water, and all you could see was a red river flowing down the street. She looked scared. We were ten. We didn't know what had happened. And we didn't, we certainly didn't know what happened after you died. I still don't know. And she was forced to find out, even if she didn't want to find out. I know she didn't, just like Khalil didn't. My door creaks open and Mama peeks in. She tries to smile. Look who's up. She sinks into her spot on the bed and touches my forehead, even though I don't have a fever. She takes care of sick kids so much that it's just her first instinct. How are you feeling, Munch? That's my nickname. My parents claimed that I was always munching on something from the moment I got off the bottle. I've lost my appetite, but I can't lose the nickname. Tired, I say. My voice was brassy. I just want to stay in bed. I know, baby, but I don't want you to be here all by yourself. That's all that I want to be is by myself. She stares at me, but feels like she's looking at who I used to be. Her little girl with ponytails and a snaggle tooth who wore a Powerpuff Girl shirt. It's weird, but also kind of like a blanket I get wrapped up in. I love you, she says. I love you, too. She stands and holds her hands out. Come on, let's go get you something to eat. We walk slowly to the kitchen, and Black Jesus hangs from the cross in the painting on the hallway on the wall, and Malcolm X holds a shotgun in a photograph next to him. Nana still complains about those pictures hanging next to each other. We live in her old house. She gave it to my parents after my Uncle Carlos moved into his humongous house in the suburbs. Uncle Carlos was always uneasy about Nana living by herself in Garden Heights, especially since break-ins and robberies seem to happen more to older folks than anybody. Nana didn't think that she's old, though. She refused to leave, talking about how it was her home and no thugs were going to run her out, not even somebody who broke in and stole her television. About a month after that, Uncle Carlos claimed that he and Aunt Pam needed help with their kids. Since, according to Nana, Aunt Pam can't cook worth a damn for those poor babies, she finally agreed to move. Our house hasn't lost its nananess, though, with its permanent odor of potpourri, flower, flowered wallpaper, and hints of pink in almost every room. Daddy and Seven are always talking before we get to the kitchen, but then they go silent when we walk in. Morning, baby girl. Daddy gets up from the table and kisses my forehead. You sleep okay? Yeah. I lie as he guides me to a seat. Seven just stares. Mama opens the fridge and the door is crowded with takeout menus and fruit-shaped magnets. All right, Munch, she says. You want turkey bacon or a regular? Regular. I'm surprised I have an option. We never have pork. We aren't Muslims. More like Chrislims. Mama became a member of Christ Temple Church when she was in Nana's belly, and Daddy believes in Black Jesus, but follows the Black Panthers' 10-point program more than the Ten Commandments. He agrees with the Nation of Islam on some stuff, but he can't get over that, that fact that they may have killed Malcolm X. Pig in my house, Daddy grumbles as he sits next to me. Seven smirks across from him. Seven and Daddy look like one of those age progression pictures they show when somebody has been missing for a long time. Throw my little brother, Sakani, in there, and you have the same person at 8, 17, and 36. They're dark brown, slender, and have thick eyebrows, long eyelashes, and almost look feminine. Seven's dreads are long enough to give both bald-headed daddy and short-haired Sakani each a head full of hair. And as for me, as if it's God, as if God mixed my parents' skin tones into a paint bucket and made my own medium brown complexion, I did inherit daddy's eyelashes, and I'm cursed with his eyebrows, too. Otherwise, I'm mostly my mom, with big brown eyes and a little too much forehead. Mama passes behind Seven with the bacon and squeezes his shoulder. 
Thank you for staying with your brother last night so we could... Her voice catches, and then the reminder of what happened hangs in the air. She clears her throat. <clears throat> we appreciate it. No problem. I need to get to the, out of the house. King spent the night, Daddy asks. More like moved in. Aisha talking about how they can be a family. Hey, Daddy says. That's your mama, boy. Don't be calling her by her name like you grown. Somebody in that house needs to be grown, Mama says. She takes a skillet out and hollers towards the hall. Sakani, I'm not telling you again. If you want to go to Carlos's for the weekend, you better get up. You better not have me late for work. I guess she's got to work a day shift to make up for last night. Pops, you know what's going to happen, Seven says. He'll beat her. She'll put him out, and then he'll come back saying he changed. Only difference is the time. I'm not letting him put his hands on me. You can always move in with us, says Daddy. I know, but I can't leave Kenya and Lyric. That fool's crazy enough to hit them, too, and they don't even care that they're his daughters. Aye, Daddy says. Well, don't let anything happen to him, and if he puts his hands on you, let me handle that. Seven nods and then looks at me. He opens his mouth and keeps it open for a while before saying, I'm real sorry about last night, Star. Somebody finally acknowledges the cloud hanging over the kitchen, which for some reason is like it acknowledging me. Thanks, I say, even though it feels weird even just saying that. I don't deserve sympathy. Khalil's family does. There's just the sound of bacon crackling and popping in the skillet. It's like fragile. It's like a fragile stickers on my forehead. And instead of taking a chance and saying something that might break me, they'd rather say nothing at all. But the silence is the worst. I borrowed your hoodie, Seven. I mumble. It's random, but I. It's better than nothing. The blue one. Mama had to throw it away. Khalil's blood. I swallow. His blood got on it. Oh. That's all anybody says for a minute, and Mama turns around to the skillet. Don't make any sense, that baby. He was he was just a baby. Daddy shakes his head. That boy never hurt anybody. He didn't deserve that stuff. Why did they shoot him? Seven asks. Was he a threat or something? No, I said quietly. I stare at the table, and all I can feel is them watching me again. He didn't do anything, I say. We didn't do anything. Khalil didn't even have a gun. Daddy releases a slow breath. Folks around here gonna lose their minds when they find out. People from the neighborhood are already talking about it on Twitter, Seven says. I saw it last night. Did they mention your sister, Mama asks? No. Just R.I.P. Khalil messages. F the police. Stuff like that. I don't think they know the details. What's gonna happen to me when the details do come out, I ask. What do you mean, baby? My mama asks. Besides the cops, I'm the only person who was there, and... You've seen stuff like this. It ends up on national news. People get death threats. Cops target them. All kinds of stuff. Well, I won't let any of that happen to you, Daddy says. None of us will. He looks at Mama and Seven. We're not telling anybody that Star was there. Should Sakani know, Seven asks? No, Mama says. It's better if he didn't. We're just going to be quiet for now. I've seen it happen over and over again. A black person gets killed just for being black and all hell breaks loose. I've tweeted RIP hashtags, read blog pictures on Tumblr, and signed every petition out there. I always say that if I saw it happen to somebody, I would have the loudest voice, making sure that the world knew what went down. But now I'm that person, and I'm too afraid to speak. I want to stay home and watch The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, my favorite show ever, hands down. I think I know every episode and every word. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious, but it's also like seeing parts of my own life on screen. I can even relate to the theme song. A couple of gang members who were up to no good made trouble in the neighborhood and killed Natasha. My parents got scared and although they didn't seem to send me to my aunt or uncle in a rich neighborhood, they sent me to a bougie private school. I just wish I could be myself at Williamson like Will was himself in Bel Air. I kind of want to stay home so I can return Chris's calls too. After last night, it feels stupid to be mad at him. Or I could call Haley or Maya those girls Kenya claims don't count as my friends. I guess I can see what she says. But I never invite them over. Why would I? They live in many mansions. My house is just many. I made the mistake of inviting them to a sleepover in seventh grade. Mama was going to let us do our nails, stay up all night, eat as much pizza as we wanted. It was going to be as awesome as those weekends we had at Haley's. The ones we still have sometimes. I invited Kenya, too, so I could finally hang out with all three of them at once. But Haley didn't come. Her dad didn't want her spending the night in the ghetto, I overheard her parents say. Mama came up. Mama came 
Maya came, but ended up asking her parents to come get her that night. There was a drive-by around the corner, and the gunshot scared her. That's when I realized Williamson is the one world, and Garden Heights is another, and I have to keep them separate. It doesn't matter what I'm thinking about today, though. My parents have their own plans for me. Mama tells me I'm going to the store with Daddy before Seven leaves for work. He comes into my room in his best buy polo and khakis and hugs me and says, I love you. See, that's what I hate. When somebody dies, people do stuff that they normally wouldn't do. Even Mama hugs me longer and tighter for more sympathy just because. Sakani, on the other hand, steals bacon off my plate and looks at my phone and purposely steps on my foot on his way out. I love him for that. I bring a bowl of dog food and leftover bacon outside to our pit bull, Bricks. Daddy gave him his name because he's always been as heavy as a brick. As soon as he sees me, he jumps and fights to break free from his chain. And when I'm close enough, his hyper butt jumps on my legs and nearly takes me down. Get, I say. He crouches onto the grass and stares up at me, whimpering with wide puppy dog eyes. The Bricks version of an apology. No pit bulls can be aggressive, but Bricks is a baby most of the time, a big baby. Now, if somebody tries to break into our house or something, they won't meet baby Bricks. While I feel Bricks and while I feed him and refill his water bowl, Daddy picks a bunch of collard greens from his garden. He cuts roses that have blooms as big as my palms and spends hours out here every night just planting, tilling, and talking. He claims a good gardener needs a good conversation as well. About 30 minutes later, we're riding in his truck with the windows down. On the radio, Marvin Gaye asks us what's going on. It's still dark out, though the sun peeks through the clouds and hardly anybody is outside. This early in the morning, it's easy to hear the rumbling of 18-wheelers on the freeway. Daddy hums to Marvin, but he couldn't carry a tune if it came in a box. He's wearing a Lakers jersey and no shirt underneath, revealing tattoos all over his arms. One of my baby photos smiles back at me, permanently etched on his arm, with something to live for, something to die for, written beneath it. Seven and Sakani are on his arm, other arm, too, with the same words beneath them. Love letters in the simplest form. You want to talk about last night, he asks. Nah. I Well, whenever you want to. Another love letter in the simplest form. We turn on to Marigold Ave, where Garden Heights is waking up. Some ladies wearing floral headscarves come out the laundromat carrying baskets of clothes. Mr. Reuben unlocks the chains on his restaurant. His nephew, Tim, the cook, leans against the wall and wipes sleep from his eyes. Miss Yvette yawns as she goes into her beauty shop, and the lights are on at Top Shelf Spirits and Wine. They're always on. Daddy parks in front of the, the Carter's Grocery, our family store. Daddy bought it when I was nine, after the former owner, Mr. Wyatt, left Garden Heights to go sit on the beach all day watching pretty women. Mr. Wyatt's words, not mine. Mr. Wyatt was the only person who would hire Daddy when he got out of prison, and he later said Daddy was the only person he trusted to run the store. Compared to the Walmart on the east side of Garden Heights, our grocery is tiny. White painted metal bars protect the windows and doors, and they make the store resemble a jail. Mr. Lewis from the barber shop next door stands out front. His arms are folded over his big belly. He sets his narrow eyes on Daddy, and Daddy sighs. Here we go. We hop out, and Mr. Lewis gives some of his best haircuts in Garden Heights. Sakani's high-top fade proves it, but Mr. Lewis himself wears an untidy afro. His stomach blocks his view of the street, and since his wife passed, nobody tells him that his pants are too short and his socks don't match. But today is today, one is striped and the other is argyle. The store used to open at... 5.55 on the dock, he says. 5.55. And it's 6.05. Daddy unlocks the front door. I know, Mr. Lewis, but I told you I'm not running the store the same way Wyatt did. <laughs> it show is obvious. First you take down his pictures. Who the heck replaces pictures of Dr. King with, with some nobody? Huey Newton ain't a nobody. Well, he ain't Dr. King. Then you hire thugs to work up in here. I heard that Khalil boy got himself shot last night. He was probably selling that stuff. Mr. Lewis looks from Daddy's basketball jersey to his tattoos. I wonder where he got that idea from. Daddy's jaw tightens. Star, turn the coffee pot on for Mr. Lewis so he can get the heck out of here, I say to myself, finishing Daddy's sentence for him. 
I flick the switch on the coffee pot at the self-serve table where Huey Newton watches over from a photograph his fist raised for black power. I'm supposed to replace that filter and put new coffee in and water, but for talking about Khalil, Mr. Lewis gets coffee made from day-old grounds. He limps through the aisles and gets a honey bun, an apple, and a pack of hoghead cheese. He gives me the honey bun. Heat it up, girl. And you bet not and you bet not overcook it. I leave it in the microwave until the plastic wrapper swells and pops open. Mr. Lewis eats it soon as I take it out. That thing hot. He chews and blows at the same time. You heated it too long, girl. About to burn my mouth. When Mr. Lewis leaves, Daddy winks at me. The usual customers come in, like Mrs. Jackson, who insists on buying her greens from Daddy and nobody else. Four red-eyed guys in sagging pants buy almost every bag of chips we have. Daddy tells them it's too early to be that blazed, and they laugh out way too hard. One of them licks his next blunt as he leaves. Around 11, Mrs. Rooks buys some roses and snacks for her bridge club meeting. She has droopy eyes and gold plating on her front teeth. Her wig is gold-colored, too. Hey, y'all need to get some lotto tickets up in here, baby, she says as Daddy rings her up and I bag her stuff. Tonight, it's at 300 million. Daddy smiles. For real? What would you do with all that money, Mrs. Rooks? Shoot, baby. The question is what I wouldn't do with all that money. Lord knows I'd get on the first plane out of here. Daddy laughs. Is that right? And who's going to make the red velvet cake for us? Somebody else, because I'd be gone. She points... To the distant, she points to the display of cigarettes behind us. Baby, hand me a pack of them Newports. Those are Nana's favorite cigarettes, too. They used to be Daddy's favorites before I begged him to quit. I grab a pack and I pass it to Mrs. Brooks. She's staring at me moments after patting the pack against her palm, and then I wait for it. The sympathy. Baby, I heard what happened to Rosalie's grand boy, she says. I'm so sorry. Y'all used to be friends, didn't you? The used to stings, but I say to Mrs. Brooks, yes, ma'am. Hmm. Lord have mercy, may my heart but broke when I heard. I tried to get over there and see Rosalie last night, but so many people were already at the house. Poor Rosalie. All she going through and now this? Barbara said Rosalie's not sure how she going to pay to bury him. We talking about raising some money. You think you could help us out, Maverick? Oh, yeah. Let me know what y'all need and it's done. She flashes those gold teeth in a smile. Boy, it's good to see where the Lord had done brought you. Your mama will be proud. Daddy nods heavily. Grandma's been gone for ten years, long enough that Daddy doesn't even Daddy doesn't cry every day. But such a short while ago that if someone brought her up, it just brought him right down. And look at this girl, Mrs. Brooks says, eyeing me. Every bit of Lisa. Maverick, you better watch out. Those little boys around here are gonna be trying it. <laughs> nah, they better watch out. You know I ain't having that. She can't date till she's 40. My hand drips to my pocket, thinking of Chris and his text. Shoot, I left my phone at home. Needless to say, Daddy doesn't know a thing about Chris. We've been together for over a year now. Seven knows because he met Chris at school, and Mama figured it out when Chris would always visit me at Uncle Carlo's house, claiming he was my friend. And one day, she and Uncle Carlos walked in on us kissing, and they pointed that friends don't kiss each other like that. I've never seen Chris get so red in my life. She and Seven are okay with me dating Chris, although if it were up to Seven, I'd become a nun. But whatever. I can't get the guts to tell Daddy, though. And it's not just because he doesn't want me dating yet. The bigger issue is that Chris is white. At first, I thought my mom might say something about it. But she was like, well, he could be a polka dot as long as he's not a criminal and he's treating you right. Daddy, on the other hand, rants about how Halle Berry acts like she can get with brothers, how she can't, how she can't get with brothers anymore and how messed up that is. I mean, anytime he finds out a black person is with a white person, suddenly something's wrong with them. I don't know what, I don't want him looking at me like that. Luckily, Mama hasn't told him, and she refuses to get in the middle of that fight. My boyfriend, my responsibility to tell Daddy. Mrs. Rooks leaves, and seconds later, the bell clangs. Kenya struts into the store. Her kicks are cute. Bazooka Joe Nike dunks that I haven't added to my collection. Kenya always wears fly sneakers. She goes to her usual... She goes to get her usual from the aisle. Hey, Star. Hey, Uncle Maverick. Hey, Kenya, Daddy answers even though he's not her uncle, but her brother's dad. You good? She comes back with a jumbo bag of hot Cheetos and a Sprite. 
Yeah, my mama want to know if my brother spent the night with y'all. Then she goes calling Seven, my brother, like she's the only one who can claim him. It's annoying. Tell your mama I'll call her later, Daddy says. Okay. Kenya pays for her stuff and makes eye contact with me. She jerks her head a little to the side. I'm going to sweep the aisles, I tell Daddy. Kenya follows me and I grab a broom and go to the produce aisle on the other side of the store. Some grapes have spilled from those red-eyed guys sampling before buying. I barely start sweeping before Kenya starts talking. I heard about Khalil. I'm so sorry, Star. You okay? I make myself nod. I, I just can't believe it, you know? It's been a while since I saw him, but it hurts, Kenya says. Yeah. Man, I feel the, te the tears coming down right now. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. I kind of hoped that he'd be in here when I walked in, she says, like he used to, bagging groceries in that ugly apron, the green one. Yeah, talking about how women love a man in uniform. I stare at the floor. If I cry now, I may never stop. Kenya pops her hot Cheetos open and holds the bag towards me, some comfort food. I reach in and I get a couple. Thanks. No problem. We munch on Cheetos. Khalil's supposed to be here with us, so, uh... You and Danasia, did you get into it last night? Girl! She sounds like she's been waiting to drop this story for hours. Devante came over to me right before it got crazy, and he asked me for my number. But I thought he was Danasia's boyfriend. Devante is not the type to be tied down. Anyway, Danasia walked over to start something, but the shots went off. We ended up running down the same street, and I clocked her. It was so funny, you should have seen it. I would have rather seen that instead of Officer 115 or Khalil staring at the sky, all that blood. My stomach starts to twist again. Kenya waves her hands in front of me. Hey, you okay? I blink. Khalil and that cop away. Yeah, I'm good. You sure? You're real quiet. Yeah. She lets it drop and I tell her, and I let her tell me about the second round she had planned for Danasia. Daddy calls me up front and when I get there, he hands me a 20. Go get me some beef ribs from Rubens, and I want potato salad and fried okra. That's what he always has on Saturdays. He kisses my cheek. You know your daddy. And get whatever you want, baby. Kenya follows me out the store, and we wait for a car to pass. The music is blasting, and the driver reclines so far back that only the tip of his nose seems to nod to the song. We cross the street to Rubens. The smoky aroma hits us on the sidewalk, and a blues song plays outside. Inside, the walls are covered with photographs of civil rights leaders, politicians, and celebrities who have eaten there, like James Brown, Bill Clinton, and there's even a, doc a picture of Dr. King and a much younger Mr. Rubin. A bulletproof partition separates the customers from the cashier, and I fan myself after a few minutes in line. The air conditioner in the window stopped working months ago, and the smoker heats up the whole building. When we get to the front of the line, Mr. Rubin greets us with a gap-toothed smile, from behind the partition. Hey, Star and Kenya, how y'all doing? Mr. Rubin is one of the only people around here who actually calls me by name. He remembers everybody's name somehow. Hey, Mr. Rubin, I say, my daddy wants his usual. He writes it on a pad. All right, beef, tater, salad, okra, y'all want barbecue wings and fries, an extra sauce for you, Star Baby? He remembers everybody's orders, usual orders sometimes too. Yes, sir, we say. All right. Y'all been saying out of trouble? Yes, sir. Kenya lies with ease. How about some pound cake on, on the house, then? Reward for good behavior. We say yeah, and we thank him. But see, Mr. Rubin could know about Kenya's fight, and he would still offer her the pound cake regardless. He's nice like that. He gives kids free meals if they bring in their report cards. If it's a good one, he'll make a copy of it and put it on the all-star wall. If it's bad, as long as they own up to it and promise to do better, he still gives them a meal. It's going to take about 15 minutes, he says. That means sit and wait till your number is called. We find a table next to some white guys who rare, you rarely see white people in Garden Heights. But when you do, they're usually at Rubens. The men watch the news on the box TV in a corner of the, at the ceiling. I munch on some of Kenya's hot Cheetos. They would taste much better with cheese sauce on them. Has there been anything on the news about Khalil? She pays attention to her phone. Yeah, like I watched the news. I think somebody, something, something on Twitter, though. I wait. Between a story about a bad car accident on the freeway and a garbage truck bag of live puppies that was found in a park, there's a short story about an officer involved in a shooting that is being investigated. They don't even say Khalil's name. That's nonsense. 
We get our food and head back to the store, and right as we cross the street, a gray BMW pulls up beside us, bass thumping inside the car. It's like it has a heartbeat. The driver's side window rolls down and smoke drips out, and the male, 300-pound version of Kenya, smiles at us. What's up, queens? Kenya leans in through the window and kisses his cheek. Hey, daddy. Hey, star star, he says. Not gonna say hi to your uncle? You ain't my uncle, I wanna say. You ain't nothing to me, and if you touch my brother again, I'll... Hey, king, I finally mumble. His smile fades and he hears my thoughts. He puffs on a cigar and blows smoke from the corner of his mouth. Two tears are tattooed under his left eye. Two lives are taken. At least. I see y'all been to Rubens here. He holds out two fat rolls of money. Make your make up for whatever y'all spent. Penny Kenya takes one easily, but I'm not touching that dirty money. No thanks. Go on, Queen, King Wings. Take some money for your from your godfather. Nah, she good, Daddy says. He walks towards us, and Daddy leans against the car window so he's at eye level with King and gives him one of those guy handshakes with so many movements you wonder how they even remember it. Big Mav, Kenya's Daddy says with a grin. What's up, King? Don't call me that, Daddy says it loudly, kind of angrily, but in the same way I would tell somebody not to put onions on or mayo on a burger. Daddy once told me that King's parents named him after that same gang he joined later, and that's what... That's why a name is important. It defines you. King became King Lord when he took his first breath. I was just giving my goddaughter some pocket change, King says. I heard what happened to her little homie. That's messed up. Yeah, you know how it is, Daddy says. Popo shoot first and ask questions later. No doubt, King chuckles. But hey, on some other business, I got a package coming and I need it to go somewhere. Can you keep it? I got too many eyes on Aisha's house. I already told you I'm not doing that stuff and it ain't going down here. King rubs his beard. Oh, okay. So folks get out the game and forget what they, where they come from. Forget that if it wasn't for my money, they wouldn't have their little store. And if it wasn't for me, you'd be locked up three years. State pen. Remember that? I don't owe you nothing, Daddy leans onto the window and says. But if you touch seven again, I'll owe you a butt whooping. Remember that now. That you done moved back in with his mama. King sucks his teeth. Kenya, get in the car. But daddy, I said get in the car. Kenya mumbles bye to me and she goes around to the passenger side and hops in. I big bad, so it's like that then, King says. Daddy straightens up. It's exactly like that. I then. You just make sure you don't get your behind, don't get out of line. You don't tell him what I'll do. And the BMW peels out. So, hopefully you've gathered at this point that Kenya's daddy is no good, and Star's dad was affiliated with the gangs at one point, but he did his time in jail, and now he's just trying to live a good and honorable life, but Kenya's dad is still kind of mixed up in that life, and clearly he's, you know, trying to drag Star's dad right back into it. Um... I think it's also evident that Star is not okay, and, you know, she hasn't really processed the fact that her friend Khalil is dead, and she was there, and it's also scary because she knows that at some point she probably will be questioned by the police, and, you know, especially with today's day and age, it's not, it's not a good thing to be a young black female up against a white police officer because you never know what will happen. So, we have left off on a juicy port part of the story. I'm kind of excited to see what happens next. Um, if any of you have any thoughts or comments about chapter three of The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas, feel free to drop some comments um, below. And I can't wait to see you next week. Have a great weekend. Be well. Try to get outside, get some fresh air, read a book, paint a picture, do something. Just get out the house a little bit. Keep your separation, but just try to do something that brings you some joy. Have a great weekend. Bye, guys.